shelter to the homeless, to clothe those who need it. Don't turn away from your own flesh and blood. They are your family. Then your light will break forth like the dawn. Your healing will quickly appear. Your righteousness will go before you and the glory of God will go behind you. You will call and God will answer. You will cry for help and God will say, here I am. Remove the heavy burden of oppression. Do away with the gossip and finger pointing. Feed the hungry, help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in the sun and God will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in the emptiest of places, restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Restore, renovate, rebuild the broken in your community. Raise up the old foundations. You will be called repairer of the broken systems, restorer of home and community. Good morning. Welcome to All Saints Lutheran Church. It's great to have you here with us to worship. Uh, if you're a guest or a visitor with us today, a special welcome to you. A uh, few housekeeping notes. Uh, it's the double glass doors on my right side. Uh, if you want to enter there and go to the front of the building for the restrooms, if that's needed. Uh, but otherwise, it's so great to have you here. It feels like fall now. It feels great. <laughs> it's a lot better than it was in August. But uh, we're here to gather in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Son of Righteousness shall rise with shining beams of healing. Let us gather under the wings of God's mercy. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, we confess our sin. Gracious God, we acknowledge sinfulness, individually and collectively, and we confess our sins, those known to us that burden our hearts, and those unknown to us but seen by you. We know that before you nothing remains hidden, and in you everything is revealed. Free us from sin's slavery, liberate us from the bondage of guilt, Work in us that which is pleasing in your sight. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Washed in the waters of baptism, we are made holy and are free to worship without fear. With a heart full of mercy and compassion, God saves us and forgives us all our sins. The dawn from on high, Jesus Christ, shines upon us and the Holy Spirit guides our feet into the way of peace. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Philippians. Paul writes, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever, I, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may obtain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this, or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If any of my young friends are with us today, maybe you can give me a honk in the horn to let me know you're here. All right, welcome. Welcome to All Saints. So I have a question for you today. Do you enjoy racing? Give me a honk on the horn if that's the case. Anyone? Okay, all right. I know at least one of my daughters, that's the case. <laughs> yeah, it's fun to race and have fun, to see who can go the fastest. And I was like that when I was your age, but as I got older, I decided to run longer races. And I want to show you something that I have here. Does anyone know what this is? You kind of put it around your neck. Yeah, it's a medal. It's a finisher's medal. Uh, this is for an Ironman race I did several years ago. And I want to show you this because they give this to people when they finish. But before I ran the race, about a week before, I ran into an older lady uh, in the grocery store who knew that I was going to be doing the race. And she asked me, so are you going to win? And I looked a little puzzled and I said, well, no, like there's thousands of people. There's even the professional racers there. Like my, my goal is to finish. And then she responded, well, you're never going to win with that kind of attitude. <laughs> and I had to kind of explain to her that that's not the point of this kind of race. That this kind of race, the point is that to finish, to see if you can get to that finish line. Well, in the lesson that Miss Linda just read for us, there's conversation about a finish line. And what the Apostle Paul is talking about is that in our life, it's like a race. And the finish line is that the end of our life when we meet Christ in person and what we do now is recognize this as a race, that we keep on going. And what Paul is saying here is that Christ is there running with us in life, God, that Christ is cheering us on, picking us up when we need to, 
uh, helping us be our guide through all of this so that when we reach that finish line, we can celebrate joyously with Christ and all the fellow believers. And so I hope that you remember that as an image for what our faith life is like. It's like a race. And it's not about who gets there first. It's about running a good race, reaching that finish line to celebrate and give thanks for the way that Christ has been with us this whole time. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. He runs with us in this race. Help us to recognize him with us. And help us to celebrate this run with him. Amen. All right, thank you for joining me. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the people, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds, because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Sometimes we labor through difficult tasks because we crave the end result of it all. This is the case with musicians, athletes, students, and a long list of other endeavors. Sometimes the work is boring, or it really wears us down. But we justify it all when we reach the end results. It was worth it. Our parable today could have simply begun with this phrase. There was a landowner who had a vineyard. That would have been easy enough. That sentence gets straight to the point. Instead, Jesus begins the parable with this phrase. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. The difference is that these details emphasize that this landowner put in the work, you might say. The parable leads us to imagine this as a sizable vineyard. So imagine the work it, it would, excuse me, so imagine the work it would be for one person to plant all of this and build the fence that surrounds it all. And the landowner dug the wine press too. What digging a wine press involved in the ancient Near East was finding a boulder 
and chiseling the whole thing into a wide bowl, inside of which the grapes would go and someone would do their best Lucille Ball impression of squashing those grapes. Yes, I just made a 65-year-old pop culture reference. Finally, the watchtower is built in order to do what all watchtowers do, allow an observer to see any approaching threats coming toward the vineyard. The irony in this parable is that this vineyard is not threatened by something on the outside, but by what is on the inside the very tenants whom the landowner, landowner entrusted the vineyard to. When Jesus told this parable, his audience would have been familiar with this business arrangement. This landowner-tenant relationship was quite common. Similar to sharecropping in America, an arrangement is worked out that the tenants will do the work and at the harvest provide a certain quantity of the produce to the landowner. So far, so good. But we know this particular landowner has done the unusual task of investing personal sweat equity into this vineyard. So this landowner has skin in the game when an arrangement is struck with the tenants. And the landowner's heart is in this vineyard. Like most parables, there is some hyperbole in this one. No real tenant would have expected to get away with beating, stoning, and killing the slaves that are sent to collect the produce that rightfully belongs to the landowner. But these parabolic tenants do that. And when the landowner's own son is sent as an emissary, they kill him too, with the idea in mind that they'll now get his inheritance. And that is the end of the parable. No recompense is paid. Jesus brings no resolution to the story. However, Jesus does ask those who are listening, the chief priests and the people, what should be done to the tenants? And they offer an answer. But instead of confirming whether they are correct, whether the landowner actually had the tenants killed, Jesus instead shifts focus. Instead of discussing the landowner and the tenants, he quotes a psalm. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. He is, foresha he is foreshadowing what is about to transpire. Today's gospel picks up right where last week's left off. So catching up on that, the crowds picked up their palm branches one day and hailed uh, Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem. And he immediately goes to the temple that day, flips some tables, then heals the blind and lame. And the chief priests witness all this, and when Jesus returns to the temple the next morning, they butt heads with him about who authorized his and John the Baptist's ministries. So he tells them the parable of two sons in a vineyard, implying that the chief priests have said that they will do God's work in the vineyard, but that, and that vineyard is Israel, but they have utterly failed to show people God's grace, mercy, and compassion. And then Jesus tells today's parable. God is introduced as one landowner who has actually put in the personal sweat equity to establish this vineyard. And this landowner cares deeply about what will come of this vineyard. The chief priests are the tenants who decide that they can run God's kingdom without God. They would rather hoard the produce of the vineyard and kill the landowner's servants and son who come to set things right. The greatest threat to the productivity of this vineyard is not an approaching enemy on the outside, but the very people who had been entrusted to care for the vineyard. To be absolutely clear on this, this parable does not criticize Jews or their faith. Too often this parable has been misinterpreted in ways that purposefully drudge up anti-Jewish sentiments. Rightfully understood in the context of scripture, Jews are the original part of this expanding vineyard and they will always have a, be a beloved place in the vineyard. This parable places fault directly on the chief priests in Jesus' day. 
who served in a hybrid religious and political leadership over the people. So the first people today, so excuse me, the first person today should check himself upon reading this parable is me. <laughs> I am the religious leader who has been entrusted to teach and preach God's word and through my life and my actions. The question this parable poses for us all today is whether your pastors are leading the congregation to recognize God's grace, mercy, and steadfast love acting out in your lives. And the question is whether your pastors are cultivating a community that cares for the poor, feeds the hungry, and sets the captive free. That is the harvest that God desires. And Pastor Ginger and I are tenants who are accountable to whatever this small patch of the vineyard yields. So Pastor Ginger and I are supposed to bring the best qualities out of you. And we are fine with carrying that responsibility. We agreed to it when we said yes to this work. An important side note here is that in Jesus' day, the chief priests were religious leaders as well as political leaders and teachers. Although today we separate all those roles, it doesn't negate the fact that God still has expectations for our leaders. These people, religious, political, educational, or otherwise, should bring out the best qualities of their people. Frankly, if God has that expectation, then you and I should also expect that of the leaders in our lives. I admit that I often have stumbled when I have failed in this matter. Yet some good news in this parable for me and for all of us is what it leaves out, the unfinished ending. Like those who responded to Jesus with a possible ending, you and I would expect the landowner to have the tenants killed for what they have done. But we aren't told that. And fortunately for us, God is far more gracious than we would ever expect or deserve. The parable concludes with Jesus shifting our attention to the stone that was rejected, which is fitting. The parable began with the landowner's agreement being rejected, then the slaves who were rejected, and finally the landowner's son who was rejected. Instead of an ending, Jesus gives us a transition, the rejected stone. The rejected stone rejects the finality of death and becomes the cornerstone for something new. Even though the worst can be thrown at the sun, he rises again to lay claim to the vineyard that rightfully belongs to the Father. God has put the blood sweat and tears into this vineyard so that it will yield grace, mercy, and steadfast love like God's own. No amount of human misdeeds will ever usurp God's rightful ownership of the vineyard. God put in the labor to establish the vineyard. God will always cultivate it to yield the produce that God desires. God will always view this as a labor of love worth doing for us. Thanks be to God. Amen.
joining our voice with the whole church of every time and place, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Holy God, you call us to work for peace and justice in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your life that we may bear fruit through work and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the abundant harvest of the earth. Bless and care for those whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables of all who hunger. May we be inspired by your servants who care deeply for your creation, especially Francis of Assisi, whom we commemorate today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Curb the impulses of greed and pride that lead us to take advantage of others. Grant that world leaders seek the fruits of the kingdom for the good and welfare of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain all who suffer with the promise of new life. Assured of your presence, heal our pain and suffering, and equip us to embrace all bodies aching for wholeness of mind, body, and soul. We call to mind those who are struggling today, especially Sally. Sally. Irma, Irma, Grace, Grace, Bill, Bill, Aloha, Aloha, Doug, Doug, Marie, Marie, Miranda, Miranda, Stephen, Stephen, Gwen, Gwen, Phil. Sally, Sally, Bob, Bob, Lillian, Lillian, Barbara, Barbara, and those we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all managers in our community and for all who seek employment. Give hope and a future to those who lack meaningful work, those who have been marginalized or abused in the workplace, and those who desire new opportunities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for the president and all who suffer on this day from COVID-19. Help us all to remain diligent help curbs people's, people's tendency to downplay this threat. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and unfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. United by the Spirit, as the body of Christ for this world, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So for our announcements today, a reminder that uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock will be the blessing of the animals. Uh, that will take place in the building back there behind the parking lot at the Kessner Center. Uh, we ask you to uh, either have your pet in a box or crate of some sort uh, uh, or uh, on a leash uh, if that's possible. Uh, please bring your own chairs. We're going to be distancing ourselves and uh, just uh, we'll have a, a good time with that. It's always a, a fun service that we have each year. So today, 4 o'clock, the blessing of the animals. Uh, on your way in, you might have noticed a small table with the uh, Christmas at Sea project. Uh, there's information on those boxes, uh, but there's also uh, an announcement about it in our parish notes. And so that's something that the Seafarers Ministry does each year. And so you can read about that and learn more about it, but uh, I encourage you to uh, grab one of those boxes on your way out. Let us now receive this charge and sending blessing. All of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is for this that you were called, that you might inherit a blessing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.
in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus is on the main line. Mm -hmm.